Ninja Turtles to me was that once this came out, there was all these copycat, uh, anthropomorphized, independent comic books coming out. Uh, and it was all started. I think it started with the Ninja Turtles. Yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. Okay, we're a little live right now, just kind of pre-show. Are we live pre-show? Yeah, it's just pre-show. We're oh, live, I gotta, pre, pre-live, live, I got I got record. Recording would be good. How much would I'm that recording. stink? I'm actually recording. I am recording. I'm impressed. And I am now recording. Sybilis. Testing my toast. Sibilis. You have syphilis? Sibilis. Hepatitis. <laughs> <laughs> syphilis, syphilis. It burns syphilis. when I pee. Gonorrhea. Gonorrhea. <laughs> Anybody can you hear me? Gonorrhea. Is this on? If you can hear me say gonorrhea, please clap. <laughs> <laughs> oh, if you have the clap, don't call me. If you have the clap, please applaud. <laughs> please, please hold your applause. <laughs> you have the clap, I don't need to shake your hand. That's cool. <laughs> All right, I'll put that book over there. So. All right. Just a couple more minutes, all good. See if uh, I can get the chat room going here. All these things that I have to do, it's like ridiculous. Oh God, I'm about to sneeze, but it looks nice. Oh good, it looks nice on the- Your sneeze will look nice? No, I'm about to sneeze, I was saying. (laughs) (laughs) I was saying it looks nice on here, Um, but I am going to move a couple of things now that I'm seeing something. Hmm. How about you go over there, and then you go over there, and you go over there. I think I'll get rid of this, because I didn't realize that it puts it there. Well, that's dumb. Put it over there now. I'm over here now. That's dumb. I didn't know it did that. All right. Well, I guess, Phil, you can have the mouse. So mouse, doing, y'all getting mouse god, and I'll move this over here. I'll be honest, we I don't know a lot about this guy, but I feel like we could have probably got this guy on the show if we just asked him. <laughs> well, yeah, after kind of going through it, but I will say this: um, this was a hard find. This was not easy. Um, I, I would definitely ha- tweet this show at him because he made. I did. On. I totally yeah. did. Um, I will say this: he's from <laughs> my home state. Yeah, he's I, from Michigan. I had to dig real deep for him. Um, it was there's not, not a lot on, There's not a lot on him. I figured that much. But uh-uh. you, the, the this is kind good. of the biggest thing he's done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and it's almost the only thing he's done. So it, it is, yeah. you know, kind of. He's, he's like a year younger than me, too. It's just annoying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's all good. To hate when someone your age is way more accomplished. Like, what have I done with my life? I <laughs> oh, no, like everybody I've ever I, known is way more accomplished yeah. than I am. It's fine. Oh All right, God, I think I that looks a little somewhere. cleaner. Let's see. All right, we should be starting here pretty soon. I I think everything works this week. <laughs> it's ha- working. Having Reagan as an intern has been. Glorious. The best thing. It's been the greatest because I'm like, could you just do this? And she's like, yup. Like, we had to go through and we had to add all of our shows into the Blueberry um, stats thing. And we had to go yeah. back and we had to do like 275 shows. And Reagan's like, yep, I'll do it. I'm like, oh, thank you, God. So she had to go in and make new links, re upload them on everything, and set them up in Blueberry, like every single show that we've ever done. Well, now you get the stats. That's good. Hey, I'm yeah. gonna. Fi- I had my video quality on low. I'm just gonna put it back to good. Okay. So it's it's gonna pop me out, and then I'll come back. Okay. You should be fine. I'll move you back. Wait yeah, for the chat room, Phil. That'll be fine. Okay, I'm back. All right. No. Well, now he's jacking nerd, and oh god, oh god, there's a button I'm touching. Wait Uh-oh. a minute. Don't touch it. No. God bless America. <laughs> oh, it's I'm touching the wrong thing. Ugh. I hate when I touch the. That's what thing. she said. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. They were mature. Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. All right. Yeah, like I said, this guy was a little tough to find some stuff. I, I bet. It's I challenging uh, your research. It well, I went into uh, articles that were interviews for him way back. You know, he's only been around since 2005. So I mean, it's it's yeah. kind of hard to get, you know, people. And they don't have like a big thing in like Wikipedia or, you know, out there. But I, I did a bunch of interviews and hopefully uh, we'll get a little story out of this. So we got some stuff. 
So and there's a movie coming, so that always works. Yeah, that's Movies cool. I saw that. I didn't know that. Yeah. So all right, kids. We can get this started as soon as Twitter hit happens. Did I get my tweet? You guys should be able to retweet. As Hammond says, it's so professional. Retweet right before we start the show. Oh, shut up, Hammond. Everybody stop what you're doing and go on social media <laughs> while we're live. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. It should have. I think it worked. Hey, look, I'm, I'm not a pro at this. I'm glad that I get this far out. So oh, I got to go to my. Hey, we up. get the three of us to show up every week. That's, I know. Yeah. That's pretty, good. That's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Stuff works. We can hear each other. There are sounds. I mean, that's a I win. know. I, yeah, that's what I think as it just kind of improves. All right. So, oh, look, it looks nice. Do you see that, that uh, picture? Isn't that beautiful? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Thor and Captain America and Hulk Bear. I love it. Hulk Bear. Isn't that hilarious? Yeah. Ugh, that's great. Okay. We can get He's started. He's good at aminals. He is really good at monomorphic. Almost as good as Phil Rude. Yeah, almost. I, yeah, Phil is really good at animals, too. That's right, David Peterson, you hack. <laughs> 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 All right, kids. We're got getting... your mouse guard right here. <laughs> <laughs> that's not his mouse guard. All right, that's a different kind of guard. Uh, Ouch. Oh. All right, we're going. Get ready, mute yourselves. We're going in three, two. Hello, on today's show we discuss David Peterson. You may recognize him as an American comic book creator best known for the series Mouse Guard. But did you know that a lot of his animals are based on real people and places from the state of Michigan? Our own sketch comedians, Imran and Phil, are back live on the drawing board, so stick around. The show starts now. Or now. Welcome back to Sketching Comedy, the show that teaches, laughs, and draws comedy and comics while you listen and watch from the comfort of your home. I'm your host, Carrie Sims, along with two of the funniest guys I know, Phil and Imran. Imran, I know that that wasn't Mouse Guard. <laughs> Danger Mouse, that's a deep cut, man. You could have right? went with Mighty Mouse. You right? could have went with Speedy Gonzalez. Right? But you picked the James Bond Danger Mouse. I mean, I don't know how many of the kids even know who that is these days oh i know it's 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 the english version it's fun and uh i figured i'd go with a little bit of obscurity because i don't know today's show is all about obscurity so uh welcome to the show imran phil how have you been doing this week i've been super busy this week i'm uh well hell i'll just announce it now i'm putting together a new show uh carrie i want you to be a part of it it's called glop it's the gorgeous <laughs> ladies of podcasting, oh. and I, I need you to be a part of this. Uh, and uh, if you need me, I'll be in my office snorting cocaine off a mirror. You guys there, figured out there, the rest of the show. Jello wrestling is part of the glop? <laughs> otherwise, I'm not li watching or listening. I give you three guesses as to what I've been watching this week. Yeah. <laughs> Glo is Glow good? Let's get a yes. recommendation. It is, uh, and I I'm from a woman's point of view. I started the other view, night, yeah. and I'm already mad that I started watching it with my wife because now I have to wait for her, What's and I can't good, just huh? tear through it. It's uh, We're only a few episodes in. We're really enjoying it. Yeah, it's really great. Mark Maron uh, does a great job in that. And, uh, the chick, it's a great cast. The chick from uh, American Gods is in it who has the same role, basically. 
<laughs> At I least in the first Al- episode. Alison Brie from Community is also, she's in it, right? I love yeah, her. Yeah, Mad Men, yeah. I didn't recognize yeah. her at first. Like, I had to have somebody point out. I was like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. She kind of she kind of looks uh, different with an 80s kind of. Uh, they, yeah, they really style. glammed her up in that. It's, it's yeah. really, it's pretty interesting. It's good. I'd, I'd check it out if I were you, Imran. I think you'd dig it. It sounds yeah. like a good 80s period piece. You know, historical. It is. It's it's historical uh, accuracy. It's a historical document. <laughs> it's like Downton Abbey of like a lady dressed up. <laughs> That's what I want. <laughs> well, thanks for being here, uh, Phil. Appreciate it, and uh, I'll try to get on that uh, new new book or podcast or whatever the hell you're putting together. So uh, we'll work on that. <laughs> A live Every, touring show. Yeah, it's That's a right. show. Oh, God, it's a tour. <laughs> Every <laughs> week, we put up a drawing challenge for you, the listener. So make sure after this show, you check out our Twitter at Sketching Comedy and uh, see if you can draw what we're asking. They're usually pretty simple, you know, from anywhere from like a dog, a, a moon, an ear. We just want something different, and uh, you'll have a week to do it. If you can, just go ahead and just tweet it right back to us, and your art might be featured right here on this podcast. If you are curious and prefer watching the live show and seeing the art created right before your eyes be sure to tune into blazing caribou that's us on youtube every wednesday that's now at 8 7 central at the top of the hour we mentioned david peterson and that's david peterson with three e's i originally wrote two e's because i wasn't paying attention i really have to like check my stuff it's really funny uh david peterson has found great acclaim in comics as the creator of mouse guard a series about intelligent mice living in a medieval society his latest project is neither a comic nor his own creation but it's obviously a labor of love directed towards one of mouse guards obvious influences peterson has spent three years creating beautiful illustrations for The Wind in the Willows, a Kenneth Graham 1908 novel about, and here we go, here's the word of the day, anthropomorphic animals living in the English countryside. And now... Yeah, say that word. All right, all right. We're all like blah, 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 blah. Uh, And now IDW is publishing a hardback edition of the novel with Peterson's illustrations. So that's really something cool to look forward to. That is very cool. I think he's a great fit for that. That's a classic book, isn't it? I don't think I was forced to read that in school, but isn't that one of those you read in school? Yeah. It, it, it's like classic children's literature, yeah. Yeah, and we'll get into that a little bit later about what that's all about. So, Well, in the news, if you are a Mouse Guard fan, hey, there's a Mouse Guard movie coming out, and the Rogue One writer, Gary Whitta, is on board. Variety reports that Fox is developing a movie based on the Mouse Guard graphic novel series with Rogue One, a Star Wars story writer, Gary Whitta, on board to pen the adaptation. Matt Reeves, director of War for the Planet of the Apes, is producing Mouse Guard, this is going to be something else, through his sixth and Idaho production company, along with Ross Ritchie and Stephen Christie, both of Boom Studios, the publisher of Mouse Guard. Fox is planning a live action movie through performance capture technology employed in Planet of the Ape films. Reeves directed 2014 Dawn of the Planet of the Apes in addition to the upcoming War for the Planet of the Apes, which opens July 2017. David Peterson created, wrote, and illustrated the Mouse Guard series set in medieval times world, set in a medieval times world without humans. The stories center on a brotherhood of mice sworn to serve their fellow mice. The series was first published in 2006 by Boom's Arcadia Studio Press and has sold nearly a million copies. Adam Kassan will executive produce The Sixth in Idaho. Boom, Adam Yolen, and David Peterson will co-produce. This is pretty exciting. I always love it when there's like new cartoony things coming out. And I think this one might be huge. What do you think, Imran? It's a uh, great talent. First of all, Matt Reeves, 
perfect for bringing these mice to life. Uh, the War for Planet of the Apes, it's, I cannot be more excited for this movie. It comes out a week after Spider-Man, and already it's getting amazing reviews, like best movie of the summer, a bleak blockbuster. This is like a war movie. But he, the magic is he has made these apes so believable and emotional, and you forget that they're apes, and you just get you buy in to the emotion, and that's hard to do. He's also attached to do the next solo Batman movie, so it's the perfect pick uh, to bring Mouse Guard to the big screen. I agree. Well, and it's interesting how they do live action movie through a performance capture technology. And if you don't know what that is, it's basically where you see all those dots on somebody's face where okay. um, yeah. They, yeah, they basically kind of uh, morph their faces into I think they did it on. Um, hmm. Was they do it a lot story. in they Lord of the Rings a, in uh what was that Christmas Gollum? story with an Tom animated Hanks. movie uh that did it was Rango if you remember mm -hmm. Rango with about the like the gecko uh, yeah it was Johnny Depp right the Johnny Depp yeah face. Johnny Depp yeah. and it was yeah. all mocap uh wow. CGI animation yeah yeah that's really neat so there really you know there needs to be an award for that they don't give out an award for like motion capture performance because Andy Circus really? like Andy Circus would own it every year yes. he's like one the of the most this team. guy yeah. yeah you can't beat Andy Circus and him uh, and uh who's the the Abe Sapien uh uh Doug Jones oh Doug Jones oh yeah Doug yeah. Jones is, is a body language guy uh um, he used to yeah. play the moon the moon guy in the McDonald's commercials that would sing. You remember oh, those? Oh, uh, yeah. Those the, 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 what was that? Mac the Knife? He would sing Mac the Knife and it was yeah. a big moon Mac head. the Knife was the, the, was the thing. That thing yeah. was creepy, dude. Yeah. That thing was always <laughs> creepy. Like, you, you thought Ronald McDonald was creepy? Him hanging out with the, <laughs> the giant moon man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nightmares. Oh, this looks really cool. And I'm really interested to see because uh, David Peterson has such a unique style of art and uh we'll get into that as soon as we get a little bit into david but i'm really curious how this is all going to work out so stay tuned and we'll keep you updated about when that movie is going to come out so let's get a little bit into david peterson since i was talking about it so there is not a heck of a lot of information on him, but what I did grab was quite interesting. Uh, Peterson originally attended Mott Community College in Flint, Michigan. So he's from Aww. my hometown, and uh, he then transferred to Eastern Michigan University, where he earned his degree in fine arts. He has a long been a fan of classic adventure stories, and at one time planned on doing some cross between an adventure story and an anthropology experiment. Okay anthropology i can do anthropology these words are all peppered in here and i'm gonna stop slowly and read them so nobody freaks out uh only uh natural animals uh to the same habitat as the main characters it gave him the problem of coming up with story devices and plots to keep everyone from simply eating each other <laughs> which is great um and i I'm shocked. David Peterson is actually joining us in our chat room right now. So hello, David. Welcome. It's so great to have you in our chat room here. No way. That's, That's awesome. That's wonderful. That is super cool. So, uh, David, wonderful. It's great to have you here. Hey, if you have a second, uh, we'll catch you right after we're out of here. How do we, how do we get him in here? We should, we should be able to sit. Let's have him his own story. Oh, my God. Hold on. Let me see. David, we could actually get you in the conversation if you have a minute. Let's see. All right. We're just going to pause for a second and get him in here. I can't, I can't draw right now. Uh, the pressure is too much. Oh, no, it's okay. <laughs> I'm drawing it's like, the man's character. It's like, you're, it's like you're playing a basketball pickup game on the yard and Michael Jordan just stops by and just wants to watch. No, yeah. I can't play if you want. <laughs> I can't play anymore. It's over. Um, hold on just a second. Let me see. How do we get him in here? I'm also having a brain lapse in judgment. Hold DM on him the link to. I am. Uh, yeah, send him the link to the. I am. Uh... That's David. Wonderful. You have an amazing natural, like he's an amazing nature illustrator. The yeah. animals, the, the plants, the flowers, the trees. Like at, at some point, it's like you see in in in, in nature books and the encyclopedia illustrations, but then. To to give these characters life and uh, it's I stylized, discovered yeah. yeah and stylized great like I remember I discovered Mouse Guard during Free Comic Book Day a long time ago yeah and I just liked it was a different size book it was oversized and the art caught my attention uh, 
Oh, yeah, we have all of it right yeah. here, and I was about to show it on there. So let's see if we can get him in here, and uh, maybe he can talk to us. Let's see if it doesn't bother him. Oh, you got it. You can use a phone too, David. Just so you know, or a computer, whichever works for you. If not, I understand. We can keep continuing here. Uh, let's keep continuing until we break him in. Why not? He's we'll working say, on it, he said. We'll so, just say inaccurate things about David until he can't take it. <laughs> <laughs> He's six foot four and used to work for the L.A. Lakers. Um, <laughs> oh, I'm just so excited. I don't even know what to say. This is Thanks wonderful. <laughs> He's six foot four and used to work for the L.A. All right, David, if you're coming in, just. Hold on, I'm just getting my mic. and. Yeah, you're doing great. It sounds good. I was even saying before the show, I was like, yeah, we probably just get David on come out of the show. Just Yay. get him. Oh, he went away. Where'd he Give go? Give him a second. Oh, there he is. He's coming back. There, there we go. Whoa, look at that. Well, yeah, that worked he out. Is. What's up? How's it going? Well, forget I'm it. I'm not even going to do the show. I'm just going to talk to you, David. How are you doing? <laughs> so wonderful to have you on here. I'm going to lock this channel so nobody gets in here now. Wow, that's really great. Uh, you're from my hometown of Michigan. Uh, I was reading a little bit about you today, and uh, I think we need to update your wiki a little bit because I want more information. Can I ask you, Flint, Michigan people, how do you drink the water when it's on fire? Like, what's the process? Like, uh, do you uh, blow it out first, or what happens? Uh, we could do a whole show just on, on Flint. <laughs> yeah. <there's, laughs> we could do several, several shows about Flint. Yes. Flint, misconceptions, the actual <laughs> horror. We could do several episodes. Do you still live there now? No, I'm I'm still in Michigan though. I'm in Ferndale, Michigan. Ah, that's okay. I where from I just Ferndale. lived yeah. before I moved out here to uh, Illinois. So I'm actually from Rochester, and I okay. uh, grew up there for a long time. You want to come here? You want to say? You want to say hi? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a fan who is uh, the fiance who is a big fan, and he's just like, wait, he's there, and I'm like, yeah. So he wanted me to show you some things that I think you've done. We have a oh yeah. Thing I from that, you beautiful frame print yeah yeah he said he he bought this at uh, wizard world in chicago uh, Jeez, that was a while ago yeah yeah um let's see you're gonna go over your book here which is absolutely gorgeous the and oversized that giant book is so cool thank you Oscar. thank you Those, uh, black and white edition black really and white is, is beautiful really cool. we're just gonna kind of look through oops that's the opening page <laughs> I'm not allowed to drop this. This is hard to do backwards. <laughs> Everything. Wait, this is a map. I don't want a map. I want like a picture of a. Let me find a picture of a cute. Finish little... your drink, Carrie. Everything yeah, will be yeah. back. Carrie, Carrie's working on her, on her bottle of wine. There we go. David, I would love to know how, like, what got you into art in the first place? Like, what were you into growing up? Yeah. In terms oh. of uh, comic books, cartoons that, that that inspired you. I mean, uh, I mean, I think every kid draws, right? So absolutely, yeah. Yep. You ask, uh, you know, like a, a pre-kindergarten or a kindergarten class, how many kids in here like to draw? Raise your hand. All the hands go up, right? Right. And with each excessive year, you'll start getting other kids' hands not going up for whatever reason. It could be that they don't feel confident enough. It could be um, that they've been told that they can't. It could be that they've found something else that, that suits their interest, that, that energizes that part of themselves, uh, whether it's sports or writing or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and just the older you go, the less kids raise their hand. And I'm mm. one of these people, I'm, I'm about to turn 40 and I'm still raising my hand. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, great. But yeah, and I grew up uh, in the eighties. So things like Thundercats and He-Man and Transformers, um, Voltron, those kind of cartoons were on the air, uh, watching a lot of Disney, uh, features, um, and then playing outside a lot. There was a lot of outside play. Oh, I in the woods that. and uh, in, in backyards and uh, getting into boyhood misadventures, climbing on school roofs and all that kind of. Well, that shows up that shows up in mouse. I mean, I can see yeah. that like it's not reference photos of the woods in mouse guard. That's that's from somebody who's lived in the woods. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, like, you know, you know what that looks like and you know what it feels like. And I think that that comes across in your artwork uh, big time. So. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Get outside, artists. Don't just <laughs> yeah. sit in your studio like we awesome. all like to do. Uh, and and uh, 
live We're life of some, you know, whether it's going to affect the way you draw or whatever, it's also going to affect the way you tell stories. Like if, if you haven't had some experiences, how can you, how can you tell other experiences for multiple characters who should have different life experiences? Right. Absolutely. Totally. Now, where'd you come up with the idea for having just this, this mouse in this world and this, in this medieval world that, uh, uh, that these little guys live in and it, it's, it's wonderful. Where did this all come from? Thank you. Um, I, I love talking animal stories and I wanted to come up with one that was as epic as all the D and D adventures and role-playing game adventures. Uh, my friends and I were playing in middle school and high school. Um, and also I was a boy scout and, uh, had lots of adventures, you know, patrolling and then the things that I did in my own neighborhood yeah. <laughs> woods. So I wanted, I wanted something that had that, that feeling of adventure and linked in my, my kind of love of, of animal stories. And I was never great at drawing people anyways. Um, so I figured yeah. it, was a, it was a good fit. Uh, I think I heard you reading from the wiki in the intro. The, yeah, at one point, yeah, it was a, it was kind of a, a bigger, more species, uh, rich, idea but I, I had the problem of how do you keep something like a mouse um or some of the smaller animals involved in the story when everything would want to eat them it's like you know the <laughs> hobbits in lord of the rings yeah when they come out of the shire and say i think we can change the world even though right. we're small right no nobody, nobody believes them but mm -hmm. nobody eats them yeah. right right <laughs> that would be the problem if i had you know mice or bunnies or whatever coming out into the world of wolves and 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 uh and ferrets and foxes right. and snakes and everything. that would be stressful mice they would it, just constantly be looking over their shoulder you'd have, yeah you'd have to always have a reason uh, a status quo kind of a, for for uh, a quid pro quo for for why uh why one won't actually attack the other and, and i just thought well that's actually the more interesting that's the compelling part of the story is how would a uh, species like that survive and thrive so mm -hmm. That's, uh, that's why mice and that's really interesting. Um, I read somewhere that you base a lot of your characters on, um, real people. Sure. Yeah. So who are you in this story? Cause, <laughs> cause everybody kind of puts a little bit of them. Who are you in this story? Sure. So Saxon is based on some of my worst personality traits. <laughs> uh, that's I, funny. <laughs> I think it's, it's funny. I mean, it's not quite as bad when I see like, JK uh, uh, Rowling saying that she's horrified that people still like Draco um, <laughs> or that D Draco has any kind of fan base. Cause she's like, he's an awful, awful person. Even in his, even in his like semi questionable moments, he's an awful person. Mm -hmm. uh, Saxon's not that bad. Uh, I, I get why people like him, but every now and then when somebody comes to me and says, Saxon's my favorite character, I think, oh, why? <laughs> what is the matter with you? Yeah. <laughs> like, well, I mean, we all rooted for Tony Soprano for six seasons. That's man, true. Like, I actually cool. just, uh, I just yep. introduced my niece, my 17-year-old niece to Breaking Bad. Yeah, again, same uh, thing. This, this yeah. week, and I'm like, so I questioned her, we're in like season two, and I went, so have you found yourself still rooting for Walt? And at what point, at, at, at what point do you think your threshold could change? Where either, like, what would he have to do yeah. to stop rooting for him? The whole and, series, like, he dares you to hate him. Yeah, you know? that's, right. my, uh, that's my personality gauge for when I meet people. Is what, At what point do you start hating Walter White? Is, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, um, people love, they root, they love rooting for villains, so you got to have a good villain. So Sax, I mean, Saxon's not really a villain, but he's um, he's got some some negative aspects to him, and it's and it's... It's because they're based on things that I'm familiar with. I'm I can be quick to temper. I can leap before I look. I can uh, uh, say screw the plan. I'm just going to forge ahead in in kind of the worst circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not always like that. I'm I'm a much more well-rounded person than Saxon is. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, Saxon Saxon is that part of me. And then uh, Kenzie is my best friend from when I was younger. Uh, oh. Jesse Glenn. He's actually he still lives in Flint as well. <laughs> um, he's, uh, uh, he was best man at my wedding. I was best man at his, uh, we were boy scouts together and the, the personality balance between the two of us, I know how to write that. Mm -hmm. I know how to write. Cause we'd even play it up when we were younger that I was the exuberant one. He was the calm level headed, uh -huh. you know, easy there partner kind of, <laughs> kind of character. And we knew how to, how to. Uh, almost purposely irritate the other with that that personality. It's very Bert Ernie, uh, kind of back and forth. So 
yeah, Ken's, Kenzie's based on Jesse, and and uh, and there are others. But in 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 that way, um, Jesse is a much more well-rounded person than than Kenzie is, and I'm mm-hmm. a more well-rounded person than Saxon is, and any other person that that has a mouse. Sorry, my dogs are going. Crazy. Oh, that's fine. Uh, any other person that has a mouse based on them. Uh, the the mouse is probably just a sliver of their personality where I just focused on one aspect and kind of exploded that part out and said, let's just explore this instead of everything. Well, I didn't get a chance, but um, I'm going to say this. Uh, This is Imran Javed. He's the one drawing uh, the Ninja Turtle right now. Uh, I just want to introduce you. And uh, I'm Carrie Sims. And this is also Phil Rude. And what's cool about our show is while we discuss people like you or a comedian or anything like that they kind of draw and pay a little bit of homage to you um and uh draw some really cool art so you're gonna get some fan art out of this when we're all done so i just wanted to point that out and say hello and gosh thanks for coming on it's really great Um, i also appreciate that neither of them are trying to draw like me no that's that's the point we do this every week we draw (laughs) in our own style and we each have unique weird senses of humor and whatever right and uh you know i love this because largely for me i show up and i have no idea the panic of a white page you know what that's like <laughs> and then i just pull a thing out of my butt and it comes together and i've that, been studying fun. usually all week trying to figure out the person and, you know getting the getting the cues down and doing everything right and Imran and Phil are like, all right, we got to draw, right? <laughs> so they usually come in. So I want to talk a little bit about the uh, role-playing game. So sure. you, you started this with Luke Crane. Now, how yeah. how how did you even come up with the idea that this, would, that this could even work into a game? Well, I played a lot of role-playing games mm-hmm. when I was uh, in middle school and high school. Um, Jesse Glenn... Uh, who Kenzie is based on uh, was was definitely one of those one of those people in my in my regular party, um, and some of the other people who have mice based on them are are part of that group, and we played a lot of stuff, and then we would modify existing systems, and mm-hmm. we would even try to create our own systems, and uh, I think that people right when uh, right when issue one or two of Mouse Guard came out, uh, people were asking, is this a role playing game? And I think it's that I just included some things in in the way the mice behave, like uh, um, say, like in, in issue one, there's a point where they they come across the the missing grain cart, and the sun is going down, and one of them says, "I'll take first watch." And I feel that's that's a role playing thing. A, yeah. it, there's, there's a little bit of a role playing trope in there where where you establish the turn order of who's taking first watch, who's taking et cetera, up through the last, because then the game master is going to roll for encounters that many times to see if anything happens on anybody's watch and if so on whose. Um, so I think fans were starting to, to feel like there might already be a role playing game. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and fans were asking and I was like, no, there's no role playing game. That'd be something that'd be great to do. Um, Mark Smiley, who founded Arkea, uh, the publishing company, he had taken, I think a year and a half or two years off of drawing his book so that he could create a role playing game for his book. Hmm. which had just recently come out at that time. And uh, and he just let me know, like, hey, I'm totally open. Arkea is totally open to publishing a Mouse Guard role-playing game if that is something you'd like to do. And I said, well, you've just shown me by example. I don't want to be the guy to sit down and create a role-playing game because it took right. you two years away from your book. <laughs> right. And, and I have just enough experience trying to make my own role-playing games from when I was in high school and college that I know how daunting of a task it is already without right. even a publishing deadline or anything so yeah and then uh and then i ended up meeting luke crane and we talked game design a little um we kind of weren't even talking about him doing the mouse guard game at first we were just talking um and then we talked kind of like in terms about what a mouse guard role-playing game could be but also just things we liked about role-playing things we didn't like about role-playing uh where the where the rule set for role player uh for a role-playing game had to like what was the responsibility of the rule set and what's the responsibility of the group to curtail bad behavior or reward good behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, And yeah, by the end of uh, that was a meal at a New York city comic con at the end of that meal, I was like, Luke Crane's going to be the guy to write my role playing game. Oh, that's neat. (laughs) I always, I always wanted to get into role playing. And I remember in high school, I bought like the Marvel superheroes role playing game. Mm -hmm. And then I realized you need friends and other people. (laughs) And that yeah. game, the game never got played. Wow, the saddest story. To this day, it's still shrink wrapped. <laughs> Probably 
pick the the best system to just you know charge in with. But uh, I know I just I did I couldn't get into like the dragons. I wanted to play with superheroes, but that's fine. there were other superheroes. Yeah. The, yeah. the bigger problem though that you had to hurdle. Have, yeah. had to hurdle for was you had to have people to play with and yes that was uh that was hard <laughs> well i guess that's the original role-playing game is kind of playing with dolls and action figures and all those types of oh, things yeah. so i mean sure. it's just you know sure. whether you're playing you just on, or... even just on the on the playground or, or in your backyard where you i mean sometimes it was because you were role-playing like things you already know right. hey we're playing star wars i'm han and you're luke oh, and, yeah. and the the garage is the death star and, right. and then you just start like running around and doing whatever. Now we have to save the Ewoks and the Ewoks mm -hmm. are actually those bushes over there. Yeah. You know, whatever. Or I always had to be the, those aren't the droids you're looking for guy. That was <laughs> sad, sad stormtrooper. Or you make up crap on your own and you're just right. like, okay, um, we're wandering around the, and this gets to be a little bit more like LARPing in some ways, but it's, it's still role playing. It's, it's, you're, you're figuring things out and playing characters, but you're like walking around the neighborhood going, okay, the sidewalks are all open like corridors, but the grass is walls and right. the street is lava. Right. And if you put mm -hmm. a wood chip at the end of somebody's driveway, it makes a bridge that goes to the driveway across. And we have to run, and there's frog guys, and you know, whatever. Well, I, I want to play that game now. That's fun. <laughs> we just make the crap up. Yeah. Let's all go outside. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, outside David, play. See? Yeah, I mean, when's the last time people played outside? I've got my daughter who, like, will Google literally next to the window what the weather is. I'm like, really? What's outside? <laughs> I'm Kids like, still open, do that. It's, it's called Minecraft now. That's all. Uh, yeah. It's just called Minecraft. Yeah, that's so, I don't. I don't know so much anymore. I mean, Minecraft yeah, that's is still... That's what everybody liked about Pokemon Go, is it got kids to go back outside and wander their neighborhood. That lasted that for, fun. like, what, a summer? And then that was that was it? Yeah, that thing's done. Yeah, it's over. So, until <laughs> the next thing. Coming, I hear it's coming back with an update this summer. Oh, no, not again. <laughs> yes. We'll see how that... I that can't wait to place. see people walk into the street in front of cars. That was the best part. They're, yeah. uh, they're, talking, they're talking about changing the way that gyms can challenge one another, which oh. would... Which would encourage more people to group en masse. Oh. So they're just yeah. going to provoke a riot. That's all. So I you can just I kind of... I don't know where this is going. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, David, okay, so I have a question. You kind of painstakingly sweat and tears for the last three years have been working really hard on um, your illustrations in The Wind and the Willows. You want to tell us a little bit about that? And you sure. can say the word this time, because I can't say it. I've been trying anthropomorphize. <laughs> oh, anthropomorphize. This is not even funny. <laughs> anthropomorphize. Say the, the anthropomorphized. Is that a word? What is it's it? a word. It was it was there, and I, I just copied and pasted it, and I was like, <laughs> I'm not going to say this properly ever. So, Wind in the Willows is a childhood favorite of mine, and... Uh, it makes it, sense. It, it sounds it, like something that you would do. It sounds like you should have actually did it in 1908. So, so go ahead. <laughs> I wasn't alive back then. Right. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the time machine doesn't have enough gas, unfortunately. Right. Uh, yeah, no, I, uh, I I wanted to draw it. It was something that I'd had on my bucket list to do at some point. Um, I, had, I, had, I did a children's book with a publisher, and that children's book publisher had when getting me to sign the the contract for the children's book had um, dangled a little bit of a carrot, like, Hey, sign this contract. You'll get to do your children's book. And when you're done with that, we'll have you do wind in the willows. We know that that's something you'd like to do. Sure. Um, we'll just have, we'll republish the text and you'll get to do new illustrations. Now, great. And I signed the contract and I did my children's book. And by the time we were wrapping up, the children's book publisher went, I said something like, well, we, we need to schedule the wind in the willows stuff just so that I know, Am I jumping right into it? Am I getting back to Mouse Guard for a little while? We just need to put it on the calendar. And they went, right. yeah, I don't know. When it, uh, or Publishing old material with new illustrations doesn't sell that well for us. Oh, no. so I don't oh, know what man. I want to do. Really? And, uh, and yeah, so it was it was t a total, like, they dangled the carrot just to get me to sign the contract. Oh, uh, learned a lesson there. That yeah, is so harsh. It was a... a unfortunate thing but so for years i just thought at some point i'll just illustrate it on my own um i'll probably just kick start it i'll do a limited edition kind of mm -hmm. a thing um just at some point and then uh, a couple of years ago idw who i had done turtles covers for mm -hmm. uh, let's see i can do i can do that right turtles covers for i'm not sure how it works but yeah it, it might be up for you oh but, okay okay on my screen it's that way but <laughs> Um, <laughs> Does it <sorry>. matter? <laughs> Wherever the turtle is right now. 
<laughs> uh, yeah, I had done Turtles covers for them. So they had a relationship with me and they said, we're starting this program uh, where we're going to republish classic text and then uh, use our stable of, of relationships with comic book artists and illustrators to, to re-illustrate them. And we were thinking of Wind in the Willows for you. And I was like, oh, that, that's <laughs> interesting. Okay, okay, okay. And, that's and then, awesome. Mm -hmm. We talked about the business side of it, and uh, and it all totally worked for me. Um, they gave me what was nice was that doing the children's book before. I also realized that book public book book publishers, which I I hate saying it that way, but traditional book publishers mm -hmm. uh, impose a lot of control and and do a lot of, of changes and asking for, for minor fixes and, and editing by committee and that kind of thing that uh, comic book publishers don't. And so the idea of being able to do Wind in the Willows with IDW, who I knew what the creative relationship would be like, that sure. I would be, you know, kind of left alone unless I said, hey, what do you think? Should I do this or the, you know, A or B of this image? Which, which one's a better, a better layout? Um, they weren't going to nitpick or do anything unless something really actually did need to be changed. So, right. um, yeah, it, took, it was, I worked on and off for about three years. It's over 70 illustrations. Wow. That's and, gorgeous. and I, I lost my mind for a little bit with them. I mean, I went, I went, <laughs> well, you were saying that you weren't going to spend two or three years on an RPG, but then you just jumped right into this and just, right. just, just took that time. It, and... It's a, uh, it's public domain, right? Wind in the willows at this point. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. dude. I, first of all, they that is a great publisher, and that original publisher is an idiot because <laughs> this is what you do: you grab mm -hmm. these public domain things and you re-illustrate them and put them out there for a new audience, a new and and you're gonna make money. Like it makes so much sense. There's so much good literature out there waiting to yeah. be I illustrated mean, again. Thank God that uh, that it didn't work out with that first publisher. Yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. Right. Because I, I the book would not have turned out the way. It, this one did. I actually have, I have a copy right here. I can yes, pull. please do show. Oh wow! When's it? Oh, is it out already? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah, came out uh, end of last year. Oh, yep. cool. Wow. Oh, very cool. I mean, it's like your opus, like uh, we talked about uh, uh, Bernie Wrightson's Frankenstein. Was it Frankenstein? Yeah, Frankenstein. Yeah, it's, so yeah. Crazy. Every, that's, that's, <laughs> oh, it's gorgeous. It's oh, that's gorgeous. amazing. Thank you. Yeah, it took a long, long time. And I just, I would never have been able to to take the time to craft that with the other publisher, I don't think. Um, they wouldn't have left me that much room for illustrations. IDW would even go like, how are we going to fit all these in? And I'm like, we, we've we got to. Right. <laughs> I can't, tr like I, I made a list of everything that was, I did, you know, first pass was I did a reread of Wind of the Willows and I made a list of everything that was illustratable. Mm -hmm. And then I narrowed that down to the 70 illustrations that we had talked about. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, the minute they went like, boy, this is going to be a lot of illustrations to tr to try to pack in. They weren't saying we couldn't. They were just kind of realizing the daunting task ahead of them book design wise. I was like, we can't narrow it down anymore. I've <laughs> already cut things that I, I want to illustrate that, mm -hmm. that didn't get into the initial 70. Oh, but they it's... were pretty much hands off, like uh, in terms of creative stuff and just let you. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, yeah. They, They're nothing. Great. there were yeah. no there were no changes. Um other than stuff for technical reasons like the uh, and I, I got to participate in some of the book design but the the only two things that really changed were the jacket cover had to get uh altered but that was just because of the dimensions um just making sure it fit and the, the, everything lined up where the spine was i had to extend the art by a bit but then because i wanted the thing that i had already planned to be on the center of the cover centered and yeah. You know, I had to either extend the other way or extend in the middle and push both ends out. Uh, it starts to get technical, but there was that. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's and all it was, like technical publishing stuff. Like, yeah, it was that's, technical publishing uh, stuff. And then one where I had drawn um, uh, Mr. Toad at the train station trying to buy a ticket. And I, I drew it with people in line behind him trying to, you know, emphasize because he's looking for his pocketbook and he doesn't have it. And he's like, oh, no, where's my where's my stuff? And I wanted the pressure of the people in line behind him. But when I yeah. drew it, I didn't, I didn't really like it. And I didn't feel like the people added anything to the, to the mix. So I, I, I made like a, a patch, a digital patch where all the people would get covered up and the background would just kind of fade out right there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I gave them both versions and I said, you know, you can use the one with the people, you can use the one without, it's up to you guys. And they picked without, which was fine. So, so, so I, really I, 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 
Uh, how do you work? You see, right now, Phil is very analog, and I'm a little digital. How do you work when you're when you're working on your illustrations? I'm I'm back and forth with both, so nice. I always end up with a finished inked traditional piece. Um, so like like on Bristol. Yep, I'm trying to find something that I can actually share <clears throat> without spoiling anything. Yeah. Oh, we love spoilers. Yeah, Come we on, do. We spoil little... everything. <laughs> Yeah, nobody watches this show. It's fine. Yeah, literally, literally two people are watching. <laughs> hey. <laughs> oh, so, yeah, look at that. Uh, this is a IDW Ninja Turtles cover that's already been uh, released. It actually there's, comes out next month. Ooh, there's pretty. Yosagi Yojimbo. Oh, there's Yosagi. We were just talking about him. Yeah. yeah. But to draw this, I, I drew the turtles. And I, I have a blog, uh, davidpeterson.blogspot.com, um, where every week I do some kind of a process or behind the scenes or something. Um, and I did a process post on this, so so anybody watching can go go, go dig cool. up and actually look at all of the steps. But in oh, general, I, I drew all of these characters in pencil, uh, even the fish, uh, every Ninja Turtle, and Usagi separately, just on copy paper. And then I okay. scanned those and then digitally shifted things around until I came up with a composition that I liked. Nice. Um, I would even make little changes if I realized like Leo's hand should be more like that than than straight or something like that. I can just do the rotate tool, um, yeah. especially with things like swords and, and how hard tangents can be when people start having weapons that crisscross. You can get one right, like, one right over somebody's eye. So you got to make little alterations. And then when you lower it, you realize like, oh, I'm hitting the corner of his mouth around now. I'm hitting the next guy over their eye or whatever. Right. So it's coming out of his head. Yeah. All <laughs> of those kind of like digital things. Being able to tweak that stuff digitally helps. Um, once I have a composition that I like and I have it locked down, I print it out on copy paper again. Uh, to do something like that, I have to print it over two, the course of two sheets and then reassemble them. Sure, yeah. And then I tape it to the back of a sheet of Bristol board, and on a light box, uh, I can see through the Bristol to the printout, and I ink uh, cleanly so that there's no pencil on the Bristol. I mean, occasionally I'll, I'll realize that something still needs to be adjusted, and I'll do a little bit of pencil, but... Uh, for the most part, my, my Bristol pieces are clean now. Uh, I love that. That's a, it's a great an combination, and you're using like the best of all the tools. Yeah, and then I scan it and do the colors digitally. So ah, okay, nice. So back and forth, back and forth. It's like as soon as I've done something analog, I got to do something digital. It's good have... you got because you got to keep both skills warm. You know, they're kind of they're they're similar, but they're a little bit unique to each thing. And uh, there's nothing like just inking on actual. Crystal board. Yeah, yeah I it's agree. Neat. Um, I have a question actually from the audience. Yes, we have one of the two people listening asking a question. <laughs> oh, somebody's watching. Um, Great. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this person met you at uh, Artist Alley at Wizard World and wants to ask you if you have any advice for any young artists out there. He said that you were very engaging back then. And Wow, that was a long time little, ago. But, yeah. Um, yeah uh, uh, did I mute somebody? We get <laughs> we get um, a lot of we got a, a lot of young artists here, and uh, what's nice is um, on this show we kind of encourage them to kind of draw and kind of take the steps to go ahead and draw because I'm kind of these guys are seasoned these are these are professional artists here, and I'm I'm the one that's uh, I guess I, I'm a draw I can draw and everything like that, but I don't um, I don't put my stuff out there I guess as much as I should. They're always yelling at me too, but I'm always like. Eh. I'm kind of shy about it, but if you have any advice for anybody out there, it would be wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. So um, drawing a lot, I think, is important, obviously. I mean, that's that's one you always hear. Um, learning how to draw lots of things, mm -hmm. uh, uh, not just characters straight on, not just characters doing cool poses, but uh, what's it look like if you drew that character from above and slightly behind them, like mm -hmm. your uh, over-the-shoulder drone kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, uh, what's what's it look like when that character falls and and kind of lands on their shoulder and their face? Mm -hmm. um, all of that kind of stuff is important to to try to learn and figure out how to draw. Um, try, would you recommend like drawing from life? Do you draw? Do you still draw? Like sit at a cafe and just sketch people. I, I don't, but um, yeah, absolutely. So so in general, I mean, I, this, this is a big, broad kind of a thing. But um, any kind of life experience and or practice is probably going to help you in the long run. Sure. So 
even if let's say you go to a cafe and you start life drawing, et cetera. And at some point you realize like, but now I've hindered myself. Uh, I feel so threatened to draw when I don't have something there in front of me. I can't just draw mm -hmm. from my head or I can't, right. I can't draw without reference or whatever. Um, even once you break that, whatever experience you got from that, there's, there's something, you know, you absorb it like a sponge and there's some benefit to that. Uh, even if, at its, at its most minor, you kept your hand moving. Yeah. Um, but, but there's probably other subtle stuff that you realized about like when you saw a calf at a weird angle or, uh, an elbow or somebody's shoulder or, or something um, when you're drawing at a cafe uh, that, that when you do want to draw a character from life or from your mind, you realize like, Oh yeah, I kind of already know how that shape works because I, I used to do it at cafes. Um, but the, the, the message that I've, I've gone to even colleges and, and uh, toured with to, um, to uh, uh, put this message out there is that it's totally cool to try to emulate uh, the people that you admire, to try mm -hmm. to become whoever your person is, whether they're a, a classic illustrator or a modern day comic artist or an, a, a Silver Age comic artist or whoever. There were times in my career where I wanted to be Jim Lee and I tried to draw exactly like Jim Lee. There were, yeah. not my career, I should say my youth, when I tried to draw like those people. Yeah. Um, I wanted to be J. Scott Campbell. I wanted to be Mike Mignola. Um, I wanted to be Travis Charest. Um, and the, and, and that's healthy. That's totally normal. You should embrace it. There's, mm -hmm. there's lots of things that can be learned from copying, from emulating. Uh, but in general, uh, you at best will always be a second rate, that person, mm -hmm. even if you get really good at it, you're always going to be a second rate, that person. If somebody wanted something to look like that person, the first person the first one that they're going to, they're going to offer that job to, or, or try to get, isn't you. It's the, right. the real it's person. That person. Right. And then you're the discount. And that's also <laughs> provided that you can do it exactly the way they do it all the time. And chances yeah. are you can't. Sure. Um, so there gets to be a point and it's probably different for lots of artists, but there gets to be a point where just like, you know, you know, when I was a child, I had childish things. And then I became an adult and I had to put away childish things. It's that kind of thing. Like there, there comes a turning point where you realize I have to start drawing like myself yeah. and stop trying to draw like these other people. So you can still look at the reference, get inspired, sure, sure. but put it away. Like don't have it in front of you and then try to draw. Um, and instead of, instead of um, just emulating by copying, start to think of it as dissecting. Uh, there's surface stuff and then there's, there's the marionette strings. There's, there's the, what's going on backstage mm -hmm. of those, of those, uh, those artists work. So like with a Mignola, the surface stuff that, you know, people like instantly recognize are big blocky shapes and, yeah. and big, big abstracted shadows and, mm -hmm. and, you know, simplify stuff. But lots of people can draw like, you know, can, can, can try to fudge that and, and, very few, if none of them, have ever gotten close to what Mignola is actually doing. And it's because you have to start dissecting it. You have to go like, well, but why? Why yeah. is that working? Why does that appeal to me? Right. I can mm -hmm. draw skinny wrists or skinny ankles, but why? Um, and then you start to dissect it and realize like, oh, the character design works like this. Or the character will always stand out against a backdrop if they're bright red. Or... Um, you know, the, the, the play of, of positive and negative space or, uh, or, or you start to look at the pacing mm -hmm. um, or the framing of an image. Why is the character not dead center in that panel, but off to the right? Um, why is there detail in this spot in the panel, but not the rest? Well, is that to focus my eyes? It's, it's about those things. And then you just take those ideas, but don't implement them the exact same way. Mm -hmm. Just realize that if the detail is a way to get focus then in your own style, use more and less detail to focus your viewer's eyes where you want. In your own way, figure out why the panel is balanced uh, and, and, and do it that way. Or, or design a character that will, that will stand out, that will be interesting, uh, but in your own way. And, and it's figuring out the behind-the-scenes stuff, the, the structure, rather than just looking at the veneer. Um, of any artist that I think is the the important thing, but that yeah, you have to you have to draw like yourself. You have to. Yes. 
That's what really you do good advice. Really and make it better. I think that's really good advice. I think uh, part of what my my hang up has always been is I like I've always told Phil and Imran is I, I can do reproductions of things like it's no tomorrow, and uh, I kind of get stuck knowing who I am as an artist. You know, if, if okay, you need me to draw you that 7-Up bottle, I can draw you that 7-Up bottle. You need me to reproduce this for you, I can do that. But trying to find your own voice within art and within drawing is really difficult. And so um, I really appreciate that, David, because it's one of those things that I've been kind of, you know, had that hang up on. And I think it's a little bit of like uh, lack of confidence too, sure. You know, like, you know, not confident in your own work and type of thing. It's like, hey, I'm confident in somebody else's work. I like what I see, I can draw. All that no problem but having that confidence in your own self and saying well maybe i could put something else out there and so. that's that's just practice like you learn yeah. to put yourself in the drawing for practice so yes. i kind of a, a follow-up for david so say you got a guy who's got a great idea and he's he's got a day job and he's been working long and hard on this book <laughs> it's scripted it's finished what is the path these days is to 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 get this thing into the most hands is it self-publishing is it shopping it around to actual physical publishers is it everything at once like what do you do nowadays it's it's all different uh every one of those options that you listed and more there are more yeah. options than that even um every one of those comes with a, a plus and a minus um a, a reason that it's a good idea and a reason that it might be a bad idea mm -hmm. and uh i think it's just talking to people who have pursued those and especially talking to people who have pursued those recently. Uh, yeah. Cause it's ever changing. How did you get mouse guard uh, off the ground and published? Sure. Yeah. I can tell that story. I, I mean, right. did, I'll, I'll kind of finish up there for a second. Um, so, so talking to people who, who have done whatever that is recently, if it's a self published thing, how did they do it? And, and ask them the pros and cons. If it's somebody who, who went to a publisher, uh, talk to people who've, who've signed publisher agreements recently with, with ongoing publishers, um, and then and then look at those pros and cons and figure out what what works best for you. Uh, the story with me with Mouse Guard and and what's what I think is funny about whenever you ask somebody like how did you break in in comics? Yeah. Have you ever notice the story is almost always different, and that's yeah. because there is no one way. Yeah. And and I kind of feel like there's this um, like this membrane around comics, right? And as soon as one person kind of like comes in through a thing, the membrane reseals right there. <laughs> and it's not like that's a now open path. Like, no. yeah, just yeah. keep doing that. Everybody else keep doing what that guy did. The door's yeah. wide open. Just keep no. funnel this way. No, that that will reseal. Maybe not after one person, but it reseals. And it just means that somebody else has to find a different way in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did a self-published first issue um, that wasn't out of like, no one will publish me or whatever. It was just, I had gone to a local convention. I had some of my mouse guard concepts with me. I was thinking I was going there to sell commissions that people would look at my existing work and then they would commission me to draw their role playing game characters or their favorite superheroes or whatever. And, uh, or animals and hats or something like that. <laughs> uh, and, and people saw the mouse guard illustrations and said, when does this book come out? Oh. And I was like, there's no book. And I said that to about three different people. And by the third one, I'm like, yeah, I should start telling people that the book's coming out Next soon. year. <laughs> <laughs> why am I telling, why am I turning these people away? So right. yeah, by like the fourth person, I was like, yeah, the book at th that convention ran uh, every six months. So I told them like, yeah, I'll have this, I'll have the, the first issue for the next convention. And did you have a story or anything at that point? Yeah. I mean, I had some stuff. I, I had been thinking about this idea for a long time. It was just... It was actually about narrowing down what is the perfect on ramp to get into this world that kind of been going on in my head for too long because it it had to be the perfect on ramp for me as a storyteller because I hadn't really ever done a comic before. I'd played around and done some sample pages, but I hadn't done something that had like, you know, page one through page twenty four and that's a story or an issue or you know. Right. It, it was never that I think influential pages uh, successfully before that. So so drawing a, wow. a whole big long thing was like, yeah. it needed to be a perfect on-ramp where I wasn't trying to do this gigantic epic that would be impossible. Um, and it needed to be the perfect on-ramp for readers. Like, I'm trying to give you a, a comic where you've got mice walking, talking in a civilization, yeah. fighting a snake. Um, that's, <laughs> that's not necessarily an easy pill to swallow. So I had to figure out what parts of it were the most important to get across quickly and get you introduced to the characters and get the action going so that you were excited. Uh, so I did, anyways, I, I self-published that as a first issue using a print-on-demand service, 
uh, did well at that local convention. I happened to be going to San Diego just to just to walk around, not as an exhibitor or anything, just to like see what San Diego is all about. Sure. Um, I, uh, I was a, a part of a, uh, this dates it, uh, a, a forum, uh, an online forum, comic <laughs> fan forum. There's a couple of and those the, still out there. Yeah, they, they still kind of exist, but they were the thing then. Sure. And, uh, a bunch of the people who were in that forum were all going to be at San Diego for like a meetup. And I thought, well, I guess I should go. That'd be cool. Uh, pinched my pennies and, and saved up and I went. Uh, and I took some copies of of that self-published mouse guard, mainly so that those people who had supported me online and said, you know, keep up the good work. Yay, mouse guard. I know you're self-publishing this thing. That'll be great. Um, I wanted them to be able to have some copies. And, uh, and I saw someone who knew me from Michigan and they said, Oh, you're trying to, you're trying to get mouse guard, uh, uh, sold to a publisher or you're trying to show it off to publishers and get a deal. And I was like, no, no publisher wants mouse guard. It's a square book about mice. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, no, people would want it. People, and I'm like, what, Marvel wants that? And they're like, <laughs> he said, no, but uh, you should talk to Arkea. They're a publisher that's specifically right now, uh, used to be Mark Smiley's company for him to self-publish his own book. But he just kind of opened the doors to let other people in and start publishing their work. And their, their um, I guess their open submission request was unusual fantasy. Boom. And I was like, oh, that's, I've got that. Yeah. And I had known Mark. I had showed him some examples of uh, role-playing game illustrations that I wanted to try to uh, get some work out of uh, many years ago back at that Chicago, that Wizard World Chicago show. Mm -hmm. um, and Mark had been wonderful. So I went over there really just thinking that Mark was going to be able to give me a great uh, kind of portfolio review, in a sense, on that issue. Tell me what I needed to do better for my next issue. And instead he said, no, we do want it. Let's publish this. Wow. Uh, so That's it was great. the right place, right time, right guy. I also felt very confident with Mark. Um, and he was, because he was an artist who had started Archaea so that he could publish his own books after having been part of a different publishing house, um, he was also very hands-off with the creative. He's like, if you want my opinion, I'm happy to give it. If something's drastically wrong, I won't let it print that way. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I can't allow us to print something that's, that's bad story wise or art wise, but, um, otherwise I'm staying out of it unless you want my help. So I, I just knew I was going to be able to, to do what I wanted to do without getting, uh, undue pressure. And then when you got it printed and it was in your hand, the first copy, what was that moment like? Oh, it was amazing. Right. It was amazing. Uh, yeah. Well, the, so the, the one where I got this, the self-published one, um, that was in black and white. How many of those did you print out? About 250. Okay, okay. It was still, it was still I mean, I think I printed it, because it was print on demand, I did a batch of 100, and then like another batch of 50, and then 75, and then a few stragglers kind of a thing. But um, I, uh, that was cool, and, and, but I had to pay for it, you know. Like, right, 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 right. It's money. different than when yeah. a publisher. That was a, that was a little different. And it was it was yeah. black and white. It was, and that's just because that's what I could afford. Right. Um, so it wasn't quite as as cool. But the the experience with with the first issue that was published by Archaea, which was technically just a color reprint of the of the first issue. Sure. I don't think I had a copy in my hand until like it came out on a Wednesday. Right. And then that Friday was the first ever New York Comic Con. Oh, wow. Oh, geez. <laughs> so I think I was traveling like the day it hit comic shops to get to New York because uh, Mark said, hey, we're RK is going to have a booth. We'd like you to be there. And uh, and so I, I went uh, to, to promote the book. And, and uh, in those days, Comic Con did like this kind of slow open where the first part of, and I don't remember if it was Thursday or for, maybe it was Thursday instead of Friday, whatever it was, um, the first part of the day was only comic shop owners, right. dealers, exhibitors and vendors, and other yeah. publishers, yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. But but there were some people from the press and and definitely comic shop owners. Yeah. Um, and they were coming up to the Archaea booth, and 
you know, all I know is that my, my book came out and there were a couple of people going like, yay, this is cool. Mm -hmm. These people like from comic shops I've heard of like Midtown Comics and Mile High Comics and stuff like that are going, we've sold out. How do we get more copies? Wow. 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 Again, yeah. great timing. Great timing for you. So, dude, that's a great story. And I think that's probably one of the most valuable things our listeners could take away. Because I know there's a lot of cats out there who have great ideas and, and they'll they'll put the work in. But then they're like, now what do I do? You know, and it's right. and what you just said is is great advice. It's a little bit of everything. You got to pound the pavement. You got to network. You got to meet people. Be at the right place, the right time. And if it's good, it's good. And it, and the, your, the audience will find you. Yeah, right. and sometimes you have to ditch an idea or or say forget it. I'm going to go back and retool it. Yeah. I was incredibly lucky with Mouse Guard that that kind of what I did on that first shot worked. But yeah. I have friends like my my friend Jeremy Bastion, uh, who does Curse Pirate Girl. Um. He had done a comic the exact same time I launched Mouse Guard. He had a self-published, creator-owned thing um, that just didn't work for him. It, it people didn't didn't buy it at that local convention. Yeah. Uh, he showed it around to some people, and it just didn't resonate. And he, even he was kind of like, "I don't know if this is the right path for me right now. I don't know if this was the right story. If yeah. this is what I yeah. should be telling." And uh, and then so he decided to do something else, which was Curse Pirate Girl. Mm -hmm. So. You know, at some point, if it's not working for you, there's some there's some stick to itiveness that you obviously have to have. But I you got to believe in it, of course. But yeah, it's hard to not be married to it if it's really like, look, this is not working. I have to pivot. That's a really hard decision to make as a creator yeah. when you're you like so Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to or, be willing to to kind of constantly be self analyzing and going, uh, you know, is this what it should be? Should I be doing something else? And that's hard because. Like you said, there are lots of people who, who spin those wheels going, yeah. is this good enough? Is this good enough? And they'll never yeah. actually make a mark on the paper or never yeah. finish the drawing yeah. or never never stop drawing like their favorite person. So it's, 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 a, it's all a balancing act. It's all about kind of finding that middle ground where you're confident enough but not cocky. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 Well, what's Fantastic. next on your plate, David? I'm working on the next installment of Mouse Guard right now, which is going mm. incredibly slowly. <laughs> uh, it's the next. The next book is called The Weasel War, which is uh, another prequel. It takes place just before the Fall book, and is uh, I've I've kind of talked about it in within the world of the books. I've I've talked about the this war that the mice have with the weasels. Uh, so this is that story. Cool. Those weasels. That's cool. great, though, that you haven't made a monthly book that you've kind of, you know, you, you put it out when it's done, when it's ready in terms of sticking to like, you know, a schedule, which that's great, too. But nowadays people are they're buying. They want trade paperbacks. They're not willing to buy individual books every month. Uh, they just want it all at once. We are a binge society. Just right. give me the whole it, story. You'd be because I've seen publishers, though, that that will then ask only for graphic novel submissions they want the whole thing done before they'll publish it yeah well yeah. and, uh, and it's it's kind of interesting to see how some of those are hit and miss yep. and i think some of them are hit and miss because you have a very narrow window to kind of catch the public's attention and when, when you drop a, a collection yep. a, a hardcover or a, a soft cover trade paperback and the the quality of the work can be there it can be a fantastic book but just doesn't land at the like people just aren't looking in that direction when it hits right timing and, is everything and, yeah and if you don't have that window you're you know if you didn't get people in it during that window you could be screwed whereas if you had published it as issues leading up to the release of the collection um you have that much more time to to kind of promote it for more yeah. people to discover it for word of mouth to spread all of that kind of thing so it's sometimes the trade thing works sometimes you got to do the you got to do the issues thing. And and in terms of a, a business model, um, like I said, I'm a big fan of Mignola. And I listened to uh, every interview that I could with him about his creative process and about mm -hmm. business stuff or how he created Hellboy. And uh, or, or just looking at what was actually coming out and the idea of doing it as a selection of or collection of miniseries um, is exactly what I wanted to do. I never wanted to do an ongoing because you yeah. have to do that soap opera writing style where you have an A plot and a B plot. And the minute that the A plot is winding down, that's when the yeah. B plot kind of picks back up. And now you've got a new subplot going in the background. And it just means that nothing ever really feels resolved. I never yeah. wanted to do an ongoing like that. I always wanted these to be um, 
kind of wrapped up mini series and that just like Mike people, I mean, I I'm lucky now that, you know, I had to hustle a little bit more at the beginning, but I'm lucky now that people know about mouse guard. People like mouse guard. Uh, people like what mouse guard is in terms of the art style and quality. So when I say, Hey, sorry guys, either because I'm working hard on the next one or because I've got personal life stuff going on, which means I can't get the next book out on time or, or close on time, or you guys are going to have to wait a little while. Um, the fan base is, is pretty cool and pretty, pretty understanding, especially now that I'm actually working on it, even though it's going really slow and people ask all the time, <laughs> when's the next one coming out? The fact that I'm tweeting out and, and sharing like little tiny snippets of panels. They're getting excited. And letting them know. Well, just, yeah. they know that I'm not just, you know. Yeah. Uh, just, but you're just, working. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm making right. it. Look, here it is. Here's a sketch. Yeah. It's like your own Game of Thrones book. <laughs> Well, um, it shows that you are going to be in San Diego Comic-Con in July. Is that true? I will be, yeah. And also, uh, that is on July 19th through the 23rd. You're also going to be in Baltimore Comic-Con uh, September 22nd through the 24th. And also following up on the New York Comic-Con on October 5th through the 8th. You've got a, you're a pretty busy boy, so uh, you got a lot of <laughs> you stuff do, going on. You do commissions on. out there? This is a cutback schedule-wise. Uh, <laughs> about 14, 12 to 14 shows a year, or appearances a year. Mm -hmm. And this year I'm down to six. And part of that is so that I can be home and trying to work on that Weasel War book. Um, you, have... you asked about commissions. Yeah, I yeah, do. Yeah. Commissions at shows. I don't yeah, right work at home, but because when I'm at home, I need to be working on mouse guard pages. Yeah. No, I just right. I want to tell the listener, go out, see David, yeah. get a commission. Mm -hmm. You get some cool art, but that's the hustle, man. You got to, if you're a band, you got to play all the clubs. If you're an independent comic book, you got to hit all the shows. It's just, that's the hustle. It's part right. of the gig. That's true. I know I hear a lot from people who say, uh, you know, you know, you never come to my neck of the woods. I live in, you know, wherever Kansas or mm -hmm. some some such Oklahoma. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I don't come to your area, but um, consider going to one of these shows. I mean, I know it's expensive and, and not in everybody's budget, but I, I can appreciate that because I also went to that San Diego that one time mm -hmm. um, when I wasn't going professionally. I was literally just going to meet up with other comic fans and, and wander around. I stayed in a hostel. I, I huh. budgeted enough for the, for the airfare and the hotel and everything and, and food or the hostel and food and everything so that um, I left myself literally $100 as spending cash at the convention. Uh, Jeez. And, and if part of your experience is that you just want to go, you want to get stuff signed, you want to talk to your favorite comic book artist or favorite illustrator or favorite writer, uh, go do it. Go do it. Right. There's lots of yeah. conventions. San Diego is one of the expensive ones. So you can you can go to the cities like um, Baltimore and Heroes Con, which just passed, um, I think are great shows if you really want to go meet your favorite uh, independent creators because it, it's not a madhouse. It's not one of those spectacle conventions. Um, your New York, New York Comic Con's gotten a little crowded, though, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it like now there's this whole process for even finding out if you can get tickets to New York, where mm -hmm. you're never going to have that problem at Baltimore or Heroes, yeah. but there's still yeah. wonderful, great conventions that pulls in a great, great guest list. And uh, and then there isn't the madhouse. You can actually spend time talking with someone. Um, and you can get a commission from them or an original piece of art if you've, if you've budgeted that for yourself. But that's the that's the best way I think is is actually go to a convention look look around and see what conventions you might be able to squeeze in even if you don't live in that area. Do you ever do the one I in go Novi, to... David? I'm sorry. I'm do, sorry? You, do you ever do the one in Novi? Yeah, uh, Novi, yeah. Michigan. Mm -hmm. I love that one. Yeah, yeah Motor City yeah. Comic Con. That's the one yeah. that I released Mouse Guard at uh, for the first time. Okay. I, I do um, kind of an on off schedule. I don't do it consistently. I'll I'll do maybe a couple years in a row and then take a little bit of a break. Um, this year was an off year for me. I didn't, I didn't do it this year, but yeah, mm -hmm. I've done it in the past. Sure. Yeah. And that's a good San one to Diego go to. is like, uh, San Diego to me, is like once in a lifetime, you got to go at least one time. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the Mecca. It's the pilgrimage. Look, I was raised Muslim. I've actually been to Mecca and did the pilgrimage. Still, I'm not satisfied. <laughs> I got to get to San Diego. And it, it does nothing yeah. for me. I want to go to the real Mecca. Yeah. It's worth doing and seeing once if if it's some, if going to conventions is something you care about, it's worth yeah. doing at least once. If you love it, that's awesome. Keep going. Uh, I know a lot of people are down on San Diego for, for various reasons about it. Not, you know, getting a little cosplay crowded. Don't know. Or, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I yeah. think I think um, as, as long as there are comic guests at a convention, yeah. 
even if they're being you know overshadowed by the big booths of the of the publishers or whatever or, or of the movie studios the movies yeah um, th- those artists are still there like i've had arguments yeah. with people at san diego who literally just are buying like a stack of my books and and talking with me in artist alley and saying yeah this convention's not about comics anymore I'm like but I'm here. You're holding <laughs> all these comics. And, yeah, yeah, look at all these comic book artists. You <laughs> bought a bunch of stuff that you didn't know about until you walked by my booth. So mm-hmm. yeah, um, it's there are pockets. You just have to find them. I think Comic Con yeah. gets a bad rap for some of that because also like when you look at the guest when they announce a guest list, it's not the Hollywood celebrities. It's not the video game publishers. Their guest list is still an author, artist, uh, yeah. writer, illustrator guest list. Absolutely. Um, they, they, I think they might do a few like voice talents, but I, I think most of that they leave up to the actual studios to announce for their own booths. But Comic Con's guest list is artists, and, uh, yeah. and their award ceremony is for artists and writers. It's not, it's it's not a you know like let's let's talk about the best superhero movie last year. Right. That's not what the awards are so they still totally honor it. Uh, but yeah, whether you go to San Diego or any other convention, try to get out there and 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 get a chance to talk to an artist. It's cool. Right? Or right. And at the very at the very least, you have Lou Ferrigno, Butch Patrick from the Munsters, and everybody who was ever on Star Trek: The Next Generation at like every convention. So if you're into that, you can literally just walk right up. I went to the Novi, Michigan one. I think Butch Patrick, poor guy, sitting in the corner by himself. I went up to talk Aww. to him just because I felt bad. Uh, I'm like, I'm sure you don't want to be here. Nobody remembers the monsters, but yeah, those, some of those celebrity encounters are hard because you, yeah, you don't want to waste their time. But I don't particularly want to buy the glossy photo, right? Yeah, <laughs> and, I, and I don't happen to have my Eddie Munster, you know, whatever. I don't have my copy of the monsters with me for you to sign or whatever. So then you're just kind of going like, well, let's chat, but you feel like you're asking the same question. <laughs> everybody has asked them like I, I talked to peter mayhew one time yeah and uh i asked him one question that i just realized as soon as i said it like that's the thing that everybody asks you isn't it <laughs> and he kind of nodded and i said is there any question that nobody's asked you before something that you wish somebody would ask you and he kind of took a pause and he went no and i was like <laughs> <laughs> and i just kind of I mean- like, okay it was nice talking to you and i just walked away uh, almost out of respect of like I don't. I don't need to be wasting your time, and I don't want to irritate you. But it's it's hard because there are people that you want to you want to fawn over and and t- try to explain to them in just a second what what they mean to you what or what they meant to you. To yeah. You. yeah. I met uh, the the voice of Roger Rabbit um, at a Motor City one time. Oh, Char- was that Fle- was that Fleischer? Yeah, yeah. Charles Fleischer. Oh, yeah, please, he's great. Roger. And, yeah, he does great. <laughs> I used to actually be able to do the like the yeah. The, yeah. The, the the rattle thing. Now I'm screwing it up. Yeah. <laughs> but I could make my whole cheek do it when I was a kid, and I would even have people like turning around on playgrounds and in grocery stores when I when I do a Roger Rabbit impression as a kid. So I was trying to impress that to him, and then it, it was doing what I just did. It was failing miserably. <laughs> in front and of I'm like, no, no, I can do it. I just have to stretch my cheek out. He's like, don't hurt yourself, kid. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Lou Ferrigno literally makes a living selling posters of him as the Hulk still to this day. Yeah. Yep. It's kind of sad. My, my but... favorite of those kind of uh, experiences was um, I got to meet Terry Jones from Monty Python at Motor City mm. last Oh, wow. Week. Yeah. Uh, nice. I'm a big Python fan, and um, he also starred in and directed an adaptation of Wind in the Willows. And I was ah. working on my Wind in the Willows, so I was able to show him all the illustrations um, before. Oh, that's really cool. I talked to them a little bit about it, and I showed him some on my phone at his booth. And then his wife was with him, and they're like, "So you, you have more of those Wind in the Willows illustrations? Where, where is your table?" And I told them. And the next day, he and his wife came over, and they flipped through the whole book, and we got to talk a little bit Python, but also talk Wind in the Willows, and uh, and it was just it was fantastic. It was magical. I'm, I'm a That's really awesome. Python fan, so that was. Uh, Whoa! Oh, real quick, what about this movie deal for Mouse Guard? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. So there's what a- can he tell us about that? Uh. You know, I don't know that I can tell you much that hasn't already been released online. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess Matt Reeves and the guy uh, from Rogue One. Uh, what else you got? Yep. Awesome. How exciting Matt is Reeves that? Is on board to produce. Matt Reeves is on board to produce, and uh, and 
Gary Whitta, who wrote one of the drafts of uh, Rogue One, who was in at the early stages. Okay, yeah. Gary has written a screenplay for Mouse Guard, and the wow. plan is to do this as a motion capture uh, kind of film, so that we really get performances out of the mice, that it doesn't look like a an animated thing that adults wouldn't want to go to unless they have kids. We, we don't want this to be cloudy with a chance of meatballs or You're going for realism. You're going Are you for looking like, uh, pretty, like more pretty towards like realism. Gollum kind of that kind of a look. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think yeah. the closest the closest analog is saying um, the animals in the most recent Jungle Book or yeah, yeah that's amazing. Planet of the Apes, except mm. yes. mice and at my yeah. scale. Oh, I mean, if they anybody could pull that off, it's Matt Reeves. But man, did you think when you first drew a mouse that you, it would be a time when they are now working on a major motion picture of your creations? Like, how that's got to be crazy. It's cool. It's cool. I have, um, I've been down this Hollywood path before. Uh, <laughs> oh, under okay. under under nowhere near as good of circuit. Like we were from the from the initial go with Fox. We were so much for, you know, I, I was like halfway around the track, essentially, compared to where I was in the previous incarnations. But that will teach you a level of um, uh, uh, cautious optimism. Yes. Sure. I'm, yes. I'm really excited by it. It's amazing. I'm also not counting my chickens before they hatch. Sure. Uh, no, I, I, yeah. You won't be happy until the thing comes out and I'm looking at it. Exactly. But everything, I mean every part of it, every person that I've, I, I get to interact with who is a part of this, uh, going from producers who were, who were involved, um, studio execs, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy with everybody on board. It, it, it awesome. all, it all fits. Gary, um, Gary came up with a script that is different. It's, it's pretty much an adaptation of fall. It is different from, from the books. It does change, uh, some, some significant events, but, uh, I think in a way that still totally feels Mouse Guard. He and I talked about what some of the the um, the backstory of Mouse Guard was in terms of like either stories I haven't gotten yet to tell, uh, things that I plan on telling, like with Weasel War or or even prehistory. And he was able to incorporate some of those things in into the film. Nice. Um, so there's stuff that that at least is inspired by I'm calling a Game of Thrones on it a little bit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's stuff that in there that's going to be like. Inspired by unpublished work and uh, yeah. and yeah, and he he was amazingly respectful with uh, like one of the things was he wanted to add a character and yeah. and yeah right you go like ooh I don't want that wait a minute what's going and, on here yeah but he he came to me and he went like so here's my reasoning and it made perfect sense um, it has to do with uh, a character who uh, Sadie in the book when we first meet her, she's alone. Mm -hmm. She's a solitary character. Uh, and, and Gary goes like, look, I, that's one of the things I love about Sadie. You have these other characters uh, going off and, and doing all these things in groups. The, the boy characters have to be in groups. They have to be in packs. And then the first time we meet Sadie, she's all by herself. Uh, and she's, she's so good at her job. She doesn't need to be in this group. She, she's the lone, the lone wolf kind of a thing. This is, mm -hmm. this is amazing. Unfortunately, alone doesn't work well on film because we don't get to understand what's going through that character's head until yeah. they can talk to another character. And sure, we could do a, a internal monologue, but Sadie's not like the main character of the film. So to have a right. character doing it, delivering an internal monologue for only a section uh, doesn't make any sense. Um, and he went, the initial like easy fix for this is we could add more mice for her to be with. But then we take away everything that's special about Sadie. And I don't want to, not everything, but but one of these key things that is important when we first meet Sadie, we could, we'd be taking that away from her. And I don't want to do that just so that she can explain herself. He said, so the character I want to add would be kind of like how a, a falcon or a ranger in yeah. Tolkien's world would have a falcon. Mm -hmm. went, but it can't be a falcon. So it'd be some kind of an insect, like a ladybug or a bee. Mm -hmm. And I was yeah, like, oh, that's great. Bee. B would be perfect. Lockhaven has a, a high cool. in it, and her cloak is purple, and a B is yellow, so the color contrast would be perfect. And so, yeah, we talked about what this B character could be, um, and then he let me name the character. So, oh, that's great. Cool. So, sidekick. You just needed a sidekick. Yeah, to, like vocalize we, things. We kind of referred to the B as almost like uh, like BB-8 or R2. Yeah, yeah or, absolutely. Um, because the B speaks in B language, but because of Sadie's responses, we'll know what the bee is saying. 
Gotcha. That dude, that's so cool because now you've established in the future that bees could be a lot of help to all the mice. And maybe there's a further story about the bee culture and how you know they're used different ways. They're you know reconnaissance bees or attack bees. That's really cool. I love how that came out organically uh, to solve a story problem. Yeah. I mean, I had, I had established in some in Mouse Guard that some mice have taken the time to actually learn the language of other species and that it's very difficult. It's not something that every mouse can do. Um, and Gary just kind of went like, let's do that right away with one of the main characters who we That's already awesome. know is a badass and make them more badass by letting them instantly be able to speak to bees. And what's That's neat awesome. is that original artwork that I showed you originally, which was already taken away from That's me, the but beekeeper. there's the a bee in oh, it. Oh, that's the beekeeper. Oh, it's going to be worth a good billion dollars. Thanks, David. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that. I did it just for you guys. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> well, God, this has been insane. David, I don't even know what to say, but thank you so much for coming on the show. You're a wonderful guest. You're a wonderful illustrator. You're an awesome dude. You got some really cool stuff coming out. We're so excited. Could you tell our listeners where they can find you, how to get a hold of you, all the good stuff? Yeah. Uh, so mouseguard.net is kind of the home base for all things mouseguard. There's links there to my blog in case you didn't get it from when I said it earlier. Um, I think there's also a link to my social media, but I'm at mouseguard on Facebook and Instagram, on, on Twitter and Instagram. And I'm just myself on, on Facebook. Um, but yeah, I try to, I try to promote myself and then talk about what's going on on all the social media. Uh, those, those three main social media things. And then there's a website, uh, that's the mouse guard site's pretty static. It just has the, the, the information that you need. Uh, but yeah, to kind of keep up, it's the blog and the social media. Yes, and the blog is very thorough. So if you're interested in all of his artwork, it, it kind of lists everything out. It'll show you anywhere from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles to the new works that he's working on now. He kind of goes through uh, explanations of uh, taking you through uh, even how to, you know, take advice when you're going through uh, some hard times with uh, your art and uh, needing to hear some criticism. So we really appreciate it, David. Thank you so much. I, I am completely overwhelmed. And uh, this was really awesome, dude. Thank you for all yeah. your advice and uh, wish you all the best of luck and, and uh, well deserved. Like uh, the movie's going to be awesome. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you and guys. you know what? And when the movie comes back out, we can have you back on. Maybe you could do some drawings with the boys and, uh, you know, do some stuff. It would be great. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back. So this whole time that David has been hanging out with us, he's been watching Imran and Phil draw his works. So Imran, why don't you just explain to us what you've drawn and why? So uh, I was working on, I was looking at David's stuff and I saw that he had done some uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle artwork. And, you know, to me, the, the, the guys who really kicked off this craze in the late 80s, I think are Eastman and Laird the minute they printed 3,000 issues of... Uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 1, self-published, black and white. If you can find one of those, it's worth a lot of money, people. They're hard to find. But if you find one, snag it. But the minute that came out, you had tons of copycat guys, tons of guys who were inspired. You had the flaming carrot, and you had, like, there was hamsters, and there was all these wacky things. I remember, like, it was a craze. So, and then I noticed David uh, I, likes to do some gray tone. I have yet to do a gray tone work. Where you start with just like a basic gray and you build the the darks and the highlights it's a lot of fun so i drew leonardo uh what I, this is another thing that you would have found in my high school uh science notebook there would have been no science notes there would have been a lot of drawings of spider-man batman and the <laughs> turtles it's another character i could draw with my eyes closed without reference like i've drawn them so many times and if you know if you're into that so i uh, love Le leonardo for the audience there nice oh. and phil what have you got working on over there I have uh, from Mouse Guard the Black X. Um, help me out with his name because I've only read it. I've never said it out loud. Uh, <laughs> how's it go, David? Kalanaw. 
Kalinaw. Yep. Oh, got it. I like him. He's sort of the uh, the legend of of the Mouse Guard. He's sort of this this legendary figure uh, with the black axe, and he's kind of. I always take him as sort of the the. Uh, I don't know if calling him the Obi Wan is a, is a perfect analog, but he's sort of the grizzled veteran. It's perfect of the Mouse Guard, uh, <laughs> I, and and sort of the. Yeah, he kind of carries the wisdom. So I I like that character and and the fact that. He's uh, the first thing that struck me about him is in winter when he fights the owl. Like he's just he's just so hardcore, even though he's the older guy and he sort of lives up to his reputation. I, I really dig this guy. So it's it's perfect that you use Obi-Wan as the example, because I created that character as an Obi-Wan mouse. I, oh, all right. Yeah, I wanted to awesome. a mouse who as an as an elderly mouse was totally able to hold his own and keep up with the young furs in a way that also let us know that he had a legend behind him, which means that when he was younger, he was even more amazing. Right. And his name, that hard to pronounce name, Kelanaw, is actually the names Alec and Ewan. Ah, oh, no way. On film. Yeah. Into a, into a kind of, faux Celtic uh, pronounced name. That oh, is fantastic. That's neat. Well, it came through. Uh, if I if it got through my thick skull and I picked it up, uh, you did a good <laughs> job uh, making the character come through. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Phil, you do great work every single week. And basically, that's our show. We ran a little long, but that is okay today. So We're totally worth it. <laughs> <laughs> we want to say thank you for listening and watching Sketching Comedy. You can subscribe to us on our YouTube channel at Blazing Caribou and listen to us every Wednesday at 8, 7 Central. Thanks to our producer, Ish Balderas Wong. Every week I say this name. Ish Balderas <laughs> Wong. Is she ever going to get tired of this? This isn't the only pun I have up my sleeve. There's more every week. I love his name. I can't get enough of it. And thanks to you, the listener, because without you, none of this could be possible. So thank you. You guys are our comic heroes. And thank you, David Peterson, for just stepping in and hanging out with us. It was such a wonderful time. We had a great little conversation with him and learned a little bit more about what we really needed to. We look forward to you tuning in next week for more animations, illustrations, and stories about the animators you love. And with that, our show comes to a draw. I've been your host, Carrie Sims, along with Imran Javed and Phil Rude. We'll sketch you next week, guys, on Sketching Comedy. Sketch you later. <laughs> Every time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It was so wonderful. God, Thank really you so much, David. It. Yeah, no problem. I just I hopped down in the... And in my studio, I needed to look up some reference real quick before I was going to go. I was going to draw on the couch tonight instead of in the studio, and I needed to look some reference up. And then all of a sudden, I saw I had these at mentions on Twitter, and I was like, "Oh, what? What are they doing? They're, they're, they're talking about me? Uh, Why? They're talking about me? I knew it. And right when I, <laughs> Why right when would I they came do that? In, you were like, "There's some information about out there about David Peterson, but not much. Right? <laughs> I can help you with that, I guess. Well, yeah, no, there is." Well, there's not like a wiki link, but I mean, there's there's enough about Mouse Guard, and I went yeah. through and actually got a bunch of interview questions and things like that. So there was a lot of good stuff that I could find. Uh, out Dave, you, dude, but. David's awesome. Like we are, like we're the same age, and kind of I feel like we grew up on the same stuff. Whether you talk about Transformers, Voltron, GI Joe, like that right. was that was uh that was all my stuff too, and yeah. uh it, it was that that was awesome. Okay, we just gotta pick more artists that are uh, hanging out on Twitter when we talk about them, right? <laughs> <laughs> Instead of We're, dead people like Jack Kirby and and, and uh, <laughs> oh wait, Dick Hill's still alive. You never know; he might want to like roll over from the grave and just come out yeah. and hang with us. Why not? We're cool. <laughs> you can reach out ahead of time and even ask some folks if if that's the kind of thing you want to do. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, we're still like, we're, we're not new to podcasting. This show particularly is a little bit new. So, you know, we're kind of getting out there. But uh, yeah, it was, <laughs> that was ballsy, David. I appreciate it. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Well, David, I have, a, I have another show called.